What's up, everybody? Welcome to The Stack. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. What's up? <laughs> On The Stack, we talk about a bunch of books that have come out this week, and we review them with our we brains do. and voices. We view and review them, Alex. All right, fair enough. I'm sorry. Retraction. Yes, I agree, Justin. Traction and retraction, Alex. Oh, my God. I'm just messing up all over the place. Why don't we kick it off with another team that's messing it up all over the place? Original mm. X-Men, number one, from Marvel, written by Christos Gage, art by Greg Land. This is a one-shot that picks up on the plot line that was set up by Brian Michael Bendis a couple of years back, where the original X-Men were taken forward in time, and then eventually, through a convoluted series of circumstances, they sent them back in time to their regular time, wiped their brains, so you got continuity back how it's working. And Christos Gage and company are like, just kidding. We're going to figure out a way to mess this up anyway. But it's actually a stealth setup, and I'm not spoiling anything here. This Marvel already announced this. It is a stealth setup to a new series called Weapon X-Men that is coming later next year. That all said, what did you guys think of this one shot? I, you know, I coming into it, I was like, uh, it sort of eased into, I was like, oh, this feels like a very thin little bit of continuity to try to park a story in. You know, when you're trying to park a car and there's not enough space and you're oh, just like trying to, and you're, but you're smashing like, all the cars yeah. and you smash into them all. You and shouldn't then, like, do that. You punch through the windshield because you're like, I wanted this spot. And then you uh, run away into the night and that's how you lose your car. Well, that's what this felt like. But as it went on, I really enjoyed this story. I liked the actual territory that Christos and uh, Greg Land carved out here. And it felt like we got to some new emotional areas with the original X-Men as they met their future and sort of failed selves. Oh, wow. That's cool. I, I really love the art. I thought the art was amazing. You're, you're a land man. Yeah. You're going to land land. Mm -hmm. Landy land. Mm -hmm. Landy Land. This is not Landy Land, like the Derek Landy, Greg Land title that came out. I was a little bummed that this was just a one shot. I thought this was an ongoing series, which to me was like, why are you going back here? Why are you going back to this point in continuity and poking this particular bear again? But like you said, Christos Gage is an old hand at this sort of thing. And I think does a good job of finding out how to ground it in character, even with the wildest of premises. I do think, conversely to what Pete is saying, I'm a big, not a big, but I'm a, definitely a Greg Ladd defender. Like, mm. I do think he has some very slick art. His Jean Grey is all over the place in this book. Yeah. Like, legitimately all over the place. I think I chalk that up to the color a little bit as well. The color mm. on the costume is inconsistent throughout the issue, which is a real bummer for me. But overall... In terms of the story, the interaction of the original X-Men with their older selves is fun. The place that we end up in, this is actually, I guess, if you didn't read what the Weapon X-Men thing is, spoiler here, but it's going to lead to essentially exiles, but with a team of all Wolverines chasing down Onslaught. That's Oops, fun. all Wolverines. Yum, Oops, yum. all Wolverines. Yeah, uh, Wolverines! I'm into that. I think that's fun. Why not? Let's go. I know they're all Wolverines and one's really like too tall. You know what I mean, yeah. Pete? Like, <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you when I was if it's tall. When I was raging the stack, I threw this here because it's like what a wild, bold kickoff to a new ongoing series. And then I was like, "Oops, yeah, I'm I agree." Not, oops. Oops. oops, but it is I kicking off. Put this in the stack. It is kicking off an ongoing series, just not the one that you thought. And I really liked this as a great way to set up the villain, is what it is. But I mm. think. That was probably sort of, quote unquote, the assignment. But what I like about Christos Gage is he sort of makes a meal of that. He gets yeah. us into the emotional ins and outs of the original X-Men, a uh, darker earth where their future selves sort of betray their dream in a way. And so I, I just thought this was a, a really well executed, uh, almost zero issue for this uh, upcoming ongoing. Yeah, I think that's probably a better way of putting it and probably why Pete didn't like it. Why don't we move on to another one that is definitely a full meal. Animal Pound, number one, from Boob Studios. There we go. Written by Tom King, art by Peter Gross. This is, of course, based on George Orwell's classic Animal Farm. It is updating it. And if you don't know the historical context, Animal Farm is about 
the Russian Revolution from 1917, I believe. And it yeah. was a lot about like, not Stalin, uh, Marx, Marxist yeah. philosophy and other things and George Communism. Orwell. Communism. Yeah. yeah. And George Orwell dealing with that through the lens of satire and animals. Here what Tom King is doing, which I don't think is abundantly clear in the first issue, but potentially will be clear in further issues, is we are getting in a pound a revolution that is between cats and dogs. Revolution! And the idea here is to play around with the idea of a two-party system yes. potentially leading to fascism and anarchy, which, again, oh, wow. I don't think is 100% clear in this first issue. I really like that idea. This first issue reading it, I was like, this is this is Animal Farm. I'm not quite sure what we're doing here. But, uh, Justin, I know you were into this. so I really liked it because I – it is that it's turning Animal Farm to a much more modern problem of a, uh, a group of people split down the middle because of old ideas and uh, not able to sort of come together. And in this first issue, I, we see that they do come together. and uh, But there's a sort of someone maybe about to take advantage of this. And I think that's such a a smart way to take the ideas of Animal Farm, update them and make them more pertinent to perhaps our own political system in a really good way. But also I think to your point, like Tom King really sneaks up on the idea and uh, doesn't rely on like, you have to have read Animal Farm to know this. Like it's really sort of well told and, and, and spun out in a great way with characters that you are on board with. And it's just a great Tom King story with a much deeper sort of bigger ideas that it's, I think are more apparent. It's fucking happen. heartbreaking, man. It's heartbreaking. And the first rule is you don't tell your last words to a cat because the cat won't give a shit at <laughs> yeah. all. And so, yeah, it's this, uh, it's, it's heartbreaking on top of heartbreaking. And then also it's like, you know, it, you need to think about what they're doing down at the pound and it's uh that that'll break your heart in fucking million pieces to begin with so uh you know it's uh it's rough all around man and uh yeah i'm i'm not I, it's it's hard because i'm on the the side of the animals here you know what i mean these humans are awful we're we're doing a horrible job you know maybe uh yeah so i i it's it's a very well done it's you got to check it out. It's just one of those books where you want to be a part of the conversation. You're going to, it's a, it's a big swing and uh, I'm excited to see where it's going to go from here. Pete, do you have separate last words just for a cat? Like your cat last words and then your human last words? Well, it doesn't matter what you fucking say to the cat because it, you know, it's a cat, but uh, puff, yeah, you should puff, have regular. Puff the fluff. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Somebody remember to puff the fluff. Uh, I, I will say that I feel like, Maybe conversely to you guys reading this issue, I had a lot of questions about what's going to happen going forward, which presumably will be answered in future issues. But that is to, how stories work. Yes, that's how stories work. But similar to the first issue, this almost felt like a zero to me where we are getting to the point of where does this diverge from Animal Farm? Because so far we are Animal Farm, but set in a pound. I want to see how it goes differently. I want to see how this society There's works. So many differences between a, par well, a pound so, and a farm, man. Well, this is what yeah. I'm saying is I spent too much time reading this issue thinking about questions like, in a farm, there are sources of food beyond the animals and ways that they can eat and support themselves and form their society. It doesn't work like that in a pound. No. Nope. Well, but I don't know if you know about dogs, they eat a lot of other dog poop. So maybe it's like oh, a cycle true. like that. That's true. <laughs> oh, Pete, you didn't you didn't like that. Wow. Anyway, that's I just have questions about how that's it's going to work going forward. But I think that's the point. So I'm very intrigued yes. to read the second issue. I also want to give a shout out here because we haven't mentioned it to Peter Gross's art. There's very oh, yeah. distinct cats and dogs here, which yeah. is hard to do. You know, like I think they feel very dynamic. They feel like characters. There's also some really nice layouts as the cats and dogs 
are talking to each other on opposite sides of the wall. What? What are you allowed? It makes it sound like you don't know the difference between cats and dogs in real life. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you're like, oh, finally someone's drawing them where I can understand. <laughs> oh, this is what a cat looks like. That's oh, a cat. Oh, yeah, that's a cat. And Here's that's a thing. dog. You look at a cat and a dog in real life. They both have four legs. They're both fussy. You can't tell any difference between oh them God. otherwise. Right. Reading this book was the first time I saw myself seeing them on screen. You know? Yeah, wow. four legs good, two legs bad. Famously. Four legs, two legs can't lose. That's what I always say. Batman <laughs> Off World number two from DC Comics. Written by Jason Aaron, art by Doug Mackey. Batman is, per the title, Off World, and he is trying to train to protect Gotham against evil aliens who potentially at some point down the road want to destroy it. Meanwhile, he is teaching robots and Tamaranians how to love and causing a revolution. Great stuff. Revolution! Yeah, this is great stuff. This is fun. It's fun to see Batman outside of his element, but still like treating, uh, you know, space adventures like they're Gotham adventures. He's just learning, training, getting better. I mean, I love the uh, uh, I own or I one character. I'm not sure how to pronounce Ioni? it, but I, okay, I would, say, great. I would say Ioni. Okay, Ioni character. I love the like part Ioni where she's Scott. like. She's like, uh, you don't drink, you don't kill. Next, you're going to tell me you don't like guns. Just fun. That's a fun thing to say to yeah, Batman. Yeah, don't drink, don't smoke. What do you do? Go to get two shoes, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah I just... bat shoes. I think it's fun to see Batman a little bit out of his element and trying to work back up the ranks a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, this is just uh, very cool, and the art's uh, unbelievable. My two this were the uh the superman the uh, philip kennedy johnson run where uh, superman's on war world feels very much like let's have batman mm -hmm. do that uh, but also the batman the animated series uh, episodes where batman met talia and was always in the desert because he had his shirt off in those and he weirdly has his shirt off in these i don't know if that's an intentional reference but it also has that like wild out of your element adventure that those episodes of animated series had which i think is really cool it is like funny him wearing his mask in space like somebody's gonna be like bruce wade yeah. what <laughs> is batman oh he's used my to it, god man. cut him some slack it's a comfort I don't thing know. all right it doesn't mean, he doesn't need he to. could run into space wolverine at any time but i do have a question for you what about the fact that batman really loves this android he like is like goes back to save the the android i mean hey, if you're a pal of batman it doesn't matter you know what i mean he's gonna save you I... do you think if if someone like someone a, a criminal on the streets of gotham like drops their iphone he's like no get it pick it up <laughs> save it it feels like I a very jason robots. aaron thing to me to take a character called i think his name is punch droid or something yes. and make us feel intense emotions about him as he sacrifices we'll himself Classic Jason Aaron type storyline really works. Like we've been saying, Doug Banky draws very dynamic action Beautiful sequences art. throughout. Yeah. Great book. It Star goes Wars back for his batarangs. You know what I mean? Like I don't know why it's what's wrong. You know? He goes and gets his batarangs, you think? All of them? You think he's friends yeah. with all of his batarangs? Yeah. Alfred, I lost a ring last night. He's like, I'm I so lost upset. Jose. Which one, Jose Master? Is Wade? Gone. Oh no. Jose. Jose. Jose uh, Oh, please. Uh, I'll pour you an extra. Here's an extra soup. Oh, yep, same thing. <laughs> have, have some extra soup, master. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention as a side note, I don't know if you guys have seen Merry Little Batman, but one of the best jokes in there is Alfred making disgusting soup for them. So good stuff. Star Wars Revelations Boilers. 2023. Number one. Sorry, buddy. From Marvel, written by Charles Soule, Mark Bernard, and Alyssa Wong, Soul. Greg Pak. Ethan Sachs, Hi. Kevin Scott, Mark Guggenheim, art by Andrea Jukes. DeVito, Chris Cross, David Baldion, Salvador Laraca, Will Slidey, Marika Cresta, and Salva Espen. This is a preview yes. of what is to come in the Star Wars Marvel Universe over the next year. So we're getting a bunch of little stories that are teeing that up. Little teasers, appetizers, Ooh. if you will. Oh, yes. I enjoyed this collection a lot more than I thought I would. I'll take I the don't... jalapeno poppers. Yes. I thought these were fun little stories. I had a good time reading this book. I think it worked whether you are looking forward to the Marvel Star Wars stuff or not. Uh, some of the yes. stories maybe a little more than others, but I like them all, I think, across the board. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it was a great collection of stories. I like the Mace Windu one. Darth Vader one was cool. First one was also really good. Yeah, I I think it it's it did a good job of getting you excited for more. And uh, yeah, I think it was a success. Great teams on these. I agree. I enjoy this as well. I in the Mace story, there are shades of Andor. I was reminded of yeah. Andor as the one in the in the prison. Uh, I also thought it was funny in the first one, um, Charles Soule's story, that he, he's like, yes, the Jedi mind trick. And it really <laughs> stuck out to me. It stuck out to me that when they very hastily named that back when they were making the first Star Wars movie, that now it's like, yes, it's a trick of the mind. So that's important philosophy to understand. <laughs> I, I, I love, that, I I love Joel Soul, who started out as a lawyer and has a background as a yeah. lawyer, coming up with a character in the Star Wars universe is like, I'm a corrupt lawyer who's going to defend whoever. Very fun. And yeah. very fun story as this bounty hunter blames Jedi mind tricks for him getting drunk and wrecking a bunch of stuff. Good times. Good and time. that works in real life, too. 100%. Shift number one from Image Comics, written by Kyle Higgins, art by Danielle DiNicolo, Francesco Mata, and Danilo Beruth, Geraldo Borges, and Chris Evanhouse. This is a collection of a bunch of stories that were previously published, I believe, in the Image 25 collection, but I'm not 100% sure. And then a new story. They're all about Shift, one of the big villains of the massive verse. What I particularly appreciated about this issue, we've talked a bit here on the show, at least this is my feeling, that as much as I love the Massive Verse titles, they've lacked a bit in terms of villains. And even mm. Shift, a character who has showed up a lot, I've constantly been like, I don't know what his deal is. Like, I legitimately yeah. am not 100% sure even what his power set is or anything like that. This felt like an essential read there in terms of fleshing out his backstory and how he connects to all of these other characters in a similar way to what you see in the rest of the Masterverse. So I really like this a lot. I thought this was very good and really built him up into being an interesting, fascinating character for me. Yeah, I mean, we talk about this a lot, uh, about just the way that Massiveverse works, and they're just so meticulous and smart about the way they sort of deploy different things. Because, yeah, these could have just been those backups, but this really, all these stories really hang together well, and this could easily be the original home of these stories in a great way. They they deploy the, this the shift character as a villain here really nicely, and it's just it, everything they're so consistent in their work across the entire massive verse. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. Well, I really enjoy about this is just the fact that not only are uh, we have this kind of uh, universe, but we're really kind of expanding and exploring characters in different ways and things are tying in. Every time I open one of these comics up, I'm blown away by the art and the art kind of fits into this, palette that they've set up which is cool so i know what i'm in the world just by the artwork and uh yeah and i'm ex i'm enjoying the exploration that we're getting with different characters and their kind of motivation so i've been i i enjoyed this Nightwing 109 from DC Comics, written by Tom Taylor, art by Stephen Byrne and Sammy Basri. This is ending the arc of Nightwing as a pirate. He is fighting against a pirate captain who is trying to usurp a secret pirate society. At the same time, he is dealing with a burgeoning fear of heights, which seems like a pretty bad thing with, Night with Nightwing. Uh. And he also yeah. finds out some information about his origin story. Yeah. I don't want to say it redefines everything, but it defines it, perhaps. Well, but it sort of defines it in a way that we were like, that's what happened. And he's yeah. like, now I have evidence. I'm like, oh, I thought we were sort of all. <laughs> yeah, I thought we were past that. that. At least like, 100 years. Deeply past <laughs> yes. it, yeah. Several decades. Uh, I, well, that's all we have to say. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed uh, this very much. Um, thought it was really badass. Some great covers. Um, yeah, we find out kind of the, uh, a little bit here, and it will be interesting to see how that kind of changes things moving all, all forward, but fun backup as well. The I love Nightwing. I love the character. I've loved this book. It's been just such a fantastic run. 
this arc has been one of my uh, less favorite runs. It feels a little bit off to, in some way. Maybe it's the use of the Rick character that I feel like was a, a sort of strange misstep. This is the character that had amnesia and was like a sort of bad boy version of Dick Grayson. Uh, bringing that back, I think, is a fun idea, but this just feels a little not quite where it is, where the story has been going. I like the idea that we get to at the end of this that Dick is going to be going back and having a reason to really confront Zuko now that he has evidence of something that we've all talked about as the <laughs> bad guy for, I want to say, 20 to 30 years. <laughs> I will mention, though, Stephen Byrne's sequence where yes. uh, he, uh, where Nightwing is, says, hey, this is an ambush to one of the pirate guys. And the pirate guy is like, how could one person be an ambush? And Nightwing says, well, and then we cut to a That's page right. where he's just taking out the entire crew. Really, really well done. Big fan of that. Well and that's why I was like a little critical here, but it's still a fantastic comic. And just the way that they marry the, the storytelling and the visuals in this book is yes. always top notch. Uncanny Spider-Man number five from Marvel, written by Cy Spurrier, art by Lee Garbett and Simone Buonfantino. Night Recaller has been captured by Orcus, or at least the division led by the Vulture. But he's got a couple of tricks up his sleeve as he and Silver Sable fight their way out. We get some big revelations here. And I think the end of the series, which is a real bummer, uh, I thought for some reason this was an ongoing. I tricked myself into thinking that uh, because I, I don't know that they announced this one as a five issue mini initially. This has been so good and so much fun. The revelations throughout this issue, the twists and turns are absolutely perfect. We finally find out also who the ghostly Bamf that's yeah. been with the news. Yeah. And that revelation Great reveal. does not disappoint at all. It's yeah. pretty cool. This is one of my favorite series of the year. I'm sure we'll talk about it more during our best How of the year. How dare you? How we'll dare you try to oh, take dear. claim? Yeah, don't, don't you lift your leg plant on this. seeds. Don't fucking plant <laughs> you seeds. You How dare you? Yeah. Well, this is, you. this is, I will say, forgetting about that, this is one of my favorite things that has come out of Fall of X. This is one of my favorite things that's yes. come out of X-Men in a long time. I had such a blast reading this series. The art was great. The writing was great. And Cy Spurrier, like we've talked about, can get very heady and complicated with this stuff. This was yeah. so clear from the get-go. Great title. And, and think... all of it was pinned into like some real emotional developments for Nightcrawler, when I feel like sometimes Cy's writing can get into just like, look at all these great ideas, which I like a lot of them. But this one had everything had a real emotional resonance, which was great. And I just love the I echo what you say, one of my favorite books of the year, I guess we'll see who loves it more when we fight about it in um, uh, six days time. But I, uh, this the Silver Sable uh, section relationship here, I just think is fantastic love. Uh, yeah, this doesn't uh, <clears throat> belong on my list. But what's nice <laughs> is this the we ending. share a list, Pete. We share yeah, a list. I know. I'm gonna have to fight both of you hard on this. The uh, the ending is great. It really lands the ship in a, a fantastic way, and uh, the Bamp stuff is really cool. So yeah, I was impressed with the ending. All right. Uh, looking on. forward to this fight, I guess? Question mark? Borealis, number one, from Dark Horse Comics, written by Mark Verreden and Aaron Douglas, art by Cliff Richards. This is about a army person. Oh, who sees yeah. oh this is good. happening to you. This is good. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I mean, my problem with this book is that there's a, a lot going on. She's a cop. She is for me, former army or special forces or something like that, right? Yeah, that can, uh, yes. People can be that. What? Right. And she has some sort of ghost powers and also sees some sort of ghosts. Again, lots of stuff going on in this book. I like the visuals quite a bit. I thought the depiction of these green, ghastly creatures that are spooking around were Let very me... interesting. But yes, take it away, Pete. Well, let me just ask you a question. When you talk to people who are both cops and then former military people, their eyes don't glow in the yellow when you're talking to them? Is that what you're saying to me? I mean, I talk to them very frequently, but yeah, I guess you're right. They do. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and you're always so... trying to salute or like uh, shake hands at the same yeah, time. It's all very confusing. I... Yeah, you do um, a little. You sort of vogue a little bit like Alex just did. I, I really like the art on this. I also think the... 
The shadow monsters are very cool. Um, there's a badass grandma in there. So uh, this book has everything you need. It's everything that Pete needs to get through the long, cold winter nights. Yeah. Um, I mean, this book, the premise is, if you boil it down, like, what if a, the beautiful Aurora, Aurora, Aurora Borealis was um, trying to kill you? Yeah. In a way, <laughs> so Ghost um, monsters. yeah. So that's a, a pretty direct line. Fun I twist. do like a, I do like our main character a lot here. So I'm on board to see what happens. Superman number nine from DC Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Bruno Redondo, stolen. From Nightwing and take it over to this title but wow. Superman has been very hurt with his fight with the chained and Lois Lane is sitting by his bedside as he tries to heal however at the same time Lex Luthor's old villains farm and the other one that I'm blanking on the name of uh, they are finally coming out of the open and attacking in a big way so lots of stuff going on here I love this title and i love i know we say this a lot but i love this title in a very different way than i love action comics they're in such different directions it's one of the first times that i remember from reading superman comics where superman and action comics have been so delineated in a different way and that and I, both I really that. good both yeah. really good at the same time um, yes. is this whole episode just going to be you pitching us your best of 2023 is that what i don't know that this is my best of 2023 but i'd say it sounds like, like you're winding up to it number three or four yeah wow we could just enjoy stuff we every episode of this we sort of say this is good <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is less good so technically we're always saying what we like best uh, is that's true our uh, uh but okay, i also lo- really enjoy this uh, book, I think, is rare for me where to introduce a lot of new villains. Uh, Graft is the other guy I think you were thinking mm-hmm. of, Alex. Yeah. Um, who's like a sort of a half robot, almost spider slayer esque villain here uh, for Superman. But uh, the Bruno Redondo art is so good, too. And especially so the area we end up in at the end of the book, I'm just so excited going forward. It sort of infects this book with a lot of the great Nightwing energy that uh, Bruno Redondo, like you said, uh, brought to that book. And it's just exciting to have two Superman books that are constantly good. Um, yeah, I some really sweet moments here with Lois and Clark, which I very much love to get Lois you in and the Clark. Feet. Gives you in the feels. Um, Yeah, weird twist at the end, but uh, great art. Uh, Just to give a further shout out to that, that sequence towards the beginning of Lois by Clark's bedside as they cut between her trying to read letters from fans and flashing through their whole relationship. Come on. Phenomenal. Great layouts. Great art. So good. Really classic stuff. Uh, and I like, it, it's weird that we have two titles where Superman is like, ooh, I'm very hurt. I have to wear different armor. But they both work in different ways and good stuff. Alien number two from Marvel, written by Declan Shalvey, art by Andreo Bacardo and Declan Shalvey. We are following up on the previous arc where the girl who was attacked on an ice planet by a bunch oh. of xenomorphs has returned there. We have a bunch of surprises and twists and turns. Again, this is a title with a lot going on. I felt like the previous arc that Declan Shalvey wrote was very straightforward. This one is jumping through multiple timelines. There's a lot of stuff going on. The art is very good. The action sequence is very good, but I'm having a little bit of a hard time following the plot here. one of my best of 2023. Take it away, Pete. Thank you. That That's what I was trying to build up. I love this. I love the pace of it. I love all the action. There's really badass moments in this. Uh, I don't care what time period we're in. I know what's going on. You kill the aliens. So, I, you know, I don't care where we are in time. I know what team I'm on. So, yeah, this, this is great. I think the alien are... Uh, revolution that's happening in 2023 i've been really impressed with it all year it's uh we've got a lot of different creative swings from different things but uh yeah look forward to fighting me about this later guys sorry let me just real quick on the count of three can we say which side we're on humans or aliens ready (laughs) one two three aliens Aliens. oh Oh, wow okay alex and i i get it because i'm just like (laughs) Get wrap your wrap your little bodies around their faces and plant your little seeds. You know, 
I love sure. that. I love something of uh, something with hug my face, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything. Face hugger, I wish. <laughs> Literally. Anyway, my aunt's a face hugger, touch especially me. around the holidays. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Uh, I, I like this as well, uh, Alex. I think. Uh, yeah, Alex. The, to, and yeah, Alex, <laughs> like in it. your face. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I like this, but not enough. Go ahead, yeah, Justin. Exactly. Let me just uh, hug your face with this idea, Alex. This is good. Uh, the the I li- I really root for the for the character who is back on her home planet trying to wreck some mm-hmm. shit, and uh, there is a lot going on, but it, it's sort of well delineated to the point where I'm like, that guy bad, that girl good. So mm-hmm. that's um, that's enough for me. I really like the story focusing on her. I, her name is not Zanth, but I, in my head, I think it's Zanth. Whatever her name is, it starts yeah. with an X. Uh, her traveling back, going back to this place, the twist at the end, really good, very emotionally into that. But again, there's just like a bunch of jumping through time. I will say, whatever else, the back in time sequences drawn by Declan Shalvey, so good. Love yeah. his art. I think, Great I think her name is Rose. I think it's Zanth. I'm going to say Zeth. Anyway, let's move and talk about the he deviant. He doesn't care. He wants to call her Zeth. Really uh, bad. Z- Zasha. Zeth. The deviant no. number two <laughs> from Image Comics, written by James Tide of the Fourth, art by Joshua JT4. Hickson. This is following a comic book writer who is doing a documentary style book about a serial killer back in the day that dressed up as a Slender Man style Santa Claus and oh killed people. God. Or did Scary. he? And now that killer seems to be back in the modern day, though he doesn't know that yet. First of all, though, here's what we got to talk about. Really awful beginning from James Todd of the Fourth, where he gets into comic book reviewers and comic book interviewers and like talks about how bad they are. Really insulting really dismissive and made me hate this stupid book take it away guys wow alex oh, feeling personally wow. attacked <laughs> have you listened to your interviews you're awful you know what i wow. mean like take Look the this. fucking medicine take the note uh, yeah pizza. take the fucking note bro uh <laughs> all of this nonsense aside this book feels deeply personal uh, to James yeah. to the point where like the the author is sort of saying like no this book's about me the character has a line in there that says <laughs> that in a way where I'm like okay and and I, I I really like a lot of times I don't like when you're the writer is very obviously inserting themselves into the story mm-hmm. but I think it really works here this story mm-hmm. is tense uh, it's emotional it's uh, we don't even really see much of the scary parts here yeah, we do find that's why I like we it. find a new body um, but there's just a lot of stuff positioned. James Tynan is great at just really setting setting stuff up, setting the dominoes up so they all fall right in the right order. And that's what this book's doing right now. Yeah, uh, JT1, you're correct. JT4 is just killing this. I love the <laughs> tension that uh, is happening between panels. When he sits down to do that interview with that guy, and then the guy starts talking and he starts talking about his partner and then he uh, realizes what's going on. And then the, right. uh, you know, make America great again. Mug is sat down. Like the tension was oh, I was just like, Holy shit. This is great. I'm reading a fucking comic and I'm like in the room going, Oh shit. Well, what are we going to do? Like, uh, I, yeah, I was having a blast with this the kind of storytelling in this way was just yeah i was just really impressed with this book i don't like horror but yet i'm having a blast with this yeah just uh really impressed um but uh, yeah and really amazing art and uh the last couple of panels i mean god damn Uh, can't wait for more in all seriousness uh james tynan could go fuck himself honestly. Wow. For, fuck, no no i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm kidding it's, his his note is well taken in terms of people doing interviews it. and asking the questions that they wrote down without actually listening to the interview i don't think that's something we do but maybe he's coming for us personally i'm not sure anyway other don't do people that. do interviews yeah, we, don't we don't do that really we would never do that. that amount of preparation <laughs> uh yeah you're absolutely right pete this is a a 
study intention throughout. They shout out Silence of the Labs at one point in here. And this definitely is a reference point for this book, particularly because you start to feel for this person who might be a killer in the book that he's interviewing. And at the same time, there's this little thing in the back of your head. I don't know if it was for you guys, but definitely for me, where I'm like, no, this guy is probably bad. This is probably a bad guy. Do not feel bad for him when he's crying but that's exactly what you do so there's a lot of playing with emotions there's a lot of tension joshua hickson paces things out really nicely really gorgeous really well done comic book james come on our show 23 could be a best of 2023 i guess we'll see what happens (laughs) spider boy number two for marvel written by dan slot art by paco medina and ty templeton this is a christmas issue of this book as Bailey Bass teams up with Captain America to take down Taskmaster. And then the backup story, we continue him teaming up with Squirrel Girl to take down a Helium King who has taken over the Thanksgiving parade and the real Santa Claus. Yeah, fun team up backup story. I mean, that backup was awesome. The season's beatings uh, line was just absolutely. I mean, this is Dan Slott having a blast and it jumps off the page. And I, yeah, I just think this was so cool. Uh, Spider Boy teaming up with Ta- uh, uh, Cap and taking on Taskmaster was really great. And it was also a fun moment of like Cap complimenting Taskmaster in such a fun Dan Slot way. I, yeah, I just feel like uh, this was just such a great, fun issue. Uh, yeah, I had a blast with this. And Do you think the, task, the Taskmaster ever gets sick of being like, my powers? Yes, I mimic people's fighting moves, so I know how to fight like blank and blank and blank. Like, I feel like that's every time we see Ta- except for in the MCU, weirdly, where he just doesn't do that. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't, but he doesn't talk, and also he's a she. Uh, it is, this book is super fun. Dan Slott, like we mentioned with the first issue, is having such a blast writing this very clearly, and that comes through. This is such an enjoyable title that I, I, I mean this complimentarily, really all ages, like there are very few comics that we're talking about in the stack here that you could just hand to absolutely anybody, and I think Spider-Boy is one of them. I think that points to... Spider Boy number one, I believe, was the number one best selling comic of the previous month, if I remember correctly. Wow. Uh, this, I mean, we'll see how this does, but I think that's part of the reason is Dan Slot is using all of these skills he's learned writing Spider Man for so long, writing all ages stories for so long, writing, starting in joke comics, and just bring it to bear in a absolutely ludicrous way that is just a Luda. blast to read. Luda. I feel like uh, on the other side of that, I just feel like Spider-Boy is a little overexposed. It's a little too much for me. Uh, we see him in a, anything Dan Slott touches is, is Spider-Boy is a main Oh, sorry, he's excited there. about a project. I mean, well, no, he's, I, excited. he's talked about this online. The oh. reason that he does it is because everything keeps selling out. Like everything yeah. that he does with Spider-Boy sells out. So I yeah, understand I'm, what you're saying, but... There's clearly a hunger there from the audience. Yeah. Feed um, the beast. Feed the beast. There's a lot of uh, Santa is real in this stack as well. So shouts to that. <laughs> Wonder Woman number four from what DC are you Comics. To say, man? Written by Todd King, art by real. Daniel Sampere and Bellin Ortega. And the front story Wonder Woman has taken a little break from the whole uh, Amazons are under attack thing to go visit a sick kid. And oh, meanwhile, man. in the backup story, the Super Sons are once again trying to babysit for Wonder Woman's daughter. However, she gets attacked by the Black Mercy. Um, great issue i have a little quibble with it but i'm curious oh. to hear what you guys Ooh, have to say. save you, your quibble you hate dying kids is that what your quibble is and you don't <sighs> think they if they're going to die they don't get a wish is that what your point is no this is a i'll say my unfair quibble because i know it's an unfair quibble but i liked the, i love the idea of wonder woman being like no i'm not getting involved in this conflict i'm going to visit this sick kid instead Similar to the Deviant talking about, you know, giving this whole red state, blue state thing of 
the parents being very uncomfortable with Wonder Woman being there because Amazons are outlawed in the United States, but at the same time, her going anyway because the kid loves it. Love that whole thing. I wish that was the whole issue. I wish they had mm. focused on that. And that was the thing that was frustrating for me here because cutting to the greater action with the sovereign defrayed a lot of the tension and power there. You know, I was looking, honestly, I was looking for like a tearjerker of an issue, something so that. So you were upset that instead of making the whole issue sappy, that they then not tried sappy. to put other stuff in. Not sappy. I, I think well, I think there's something to be said for that. That like that's exactly what Wonder Woman did the last issue is she walked into the offices of Sarge Steele and said, Hey, I know you have this whole conflict with me. I need this information and said, I don't care. I don't care what's going on. I need to get to the bottom of this. And this feels like very similar to me, where she's like, Hey, I know the entire US government is gutting for me right now this is the most important thing. And I love that, but I want the focus on that. It's surprising to me with Tom King, a author who very classically at this point is like, I'm going to do one issue about one thing. The end is yeah. like, let's follow multiple threads. Let's see what's going on with Steve's Trevor. Let's see what's going on with the sovereign. Instead, I want to see him focus on wonder woman and the sick kid. Well, I, I understand your point. I just think, it's only the fourth issue. Like he's got a lot of plates spinning already. Uh, but I, I think, I think we could have done all of this that's in there with just a little more explicit language. Like you're saying of being like, I know this is what's happening, but I need to do this. Like that would have helped to, to give it justification. Cause I really like the moment where Wonder Woman's like, Oh, you really want to go to, yeah. Oh man. The Paradise Can Island. That's the one that. place you want to yeah, go. Okay. That's where you want to go. Okay. You know how yeah. hard it is to get you into that island. Like this is really gonna fuck up my whole shit. Yeah. And I, so that was really nice. I thought. Yeah. But. Yeah. No, I agree. It's just one of those things where it, it it's it's an interesting situation to put Wonder Woman. You know what I mean? And the fact that she does the right thing uh, is awesome. Um, yeah. I mean. Sure, I you know I guess we could have stayed with the sick kid the whole time, but it is nice to touch in and get other stuff that's also going on. Um, I I hear what you're saying, Alex. Like, go for it. Like, let's lean into it. Let's kind of like all cry and over the sick kid. You know what I mean? Who's gonna die? Who's probably dead already now by the time. <laughs> Pete, <laughs> Jesus. But, but, yeah, he probably, I, I, honestly, like, he probably shot himself as he died. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, uh, the thing the thing is, like, I think it's hard to, when it, with a story with such emotionality, it's hard to jump out of it to just some bet business and then jump back and ha have you feel the same way, you know what I mean? So I, I think that's where it's a little bit disjunctive. And so that's where I think a little bit more connective tissue would have would have really sewed it up. But I, I thought the beats really worked. I do want to throw it out to the backup stories. These Super Sons babysitting for Trinity stories are so yeah, much fun. Really fun. Yeah. It is such a palate cleanser from literally everything else that Tom King is doing, including Animal Pound, including this. Um, it is such a good time. I laughed out loud multiple times reading the stories. Great, great stuff. Really, really good. Astonishing Iceman, number five from Marvel, written by Steve Orlando, art by Vincenzo Caruto. This is the final issue of this series. As Iceman fights for his boyfriend's life in his ice palace, um, this kind of ends up where we thought it would end up, but there's still a little twist at the same time. Justin, I'm curious to hear from you. I know you and I speculated a lot about where this was going. How did you feel about the ending here? Uh, I liked the ending. I mean, our speculation, just to name it, I think was very much like, oh, wow, this is going to – this is not going to go well for Iceman like, because it feels like he actually did die and this is a a holding on to of that, that person from this uh, other uh, super-powered um, partner for Iceman. But, oh, I actually like this better. It, it was less tragic and sort of a nicer way of uh, using the relationship metaphor – and su supporting each other through no matter what's happening and, and people being in different places while still being able to maintain a, a strong relationship. So I really liked that. I, and I liked the sort of coda that we got at the end. 
Yeah, I agree. I think this was really nice. Uh, I like the heart kind of uh, hearts at the end there. Um, yeah, I I think the art's amazing. It's cool, the different kind of versions of Iceman we kind of see in this. So, yeah, uh, creepy-ass villain. Um, amazing art. Geiger, Ground Zero, number two from Image Comics, written by Jeff Johns, art by Gary Frank. This is the second and last issue of this prequel series to the original Geiger. Now, I, I wanted to mention, P. Last issue, you shouted out that you thought this was very good. You really liked this. I think Justin and I disagreed in terms of liking it, in terms of art and plot, but felt it was kind of unnecessary. The thing that I was thinking about going into this one that's become more abundantly clear is Jeff Johns, Gary Frank, and a bunch of other folks have formed a company called Ghost Machine that's going to be an yeah. imprint over at Image Comics. So I think what they're doing Ghost here in the machine. What they're doing mm. here is they're doing a two issue prequel to basically set up this Ghost Machine one shot that I believe is coming in January. And then they're having a bunch of ongoing titles that are happening after that. So this is this is the reset. They had Mad Ghost is I think Jeff John's imprint. Now that they have Ghost Machine, they're basically like, okay, we got to reset up this thing as a shared universe with a bunch of other characters. So knowing that going in, I like this issue a lot better. And this gives us some new information about the Gargoyle character that I thought was very interesting. Gary Frank's art, of course, as always, great. Well, you dumped a lot on me here, so let me just kind of back up the truck a little bit. First off, I mean, mm. that's a lot to put into ghosts. I mean, some people don't even believe in ghosts and you're going to, you know, uh, label your whole thing after a ghost. So that's kind of risky. You know what I mean? You can lose. You worry that the ghosts are going to come for him. Or, you know, the, the people who, do, you know, pretend that ghosts aren't real are going to kind of like, you know, ignore this kind of stuff. And I pretend. feel like you're alienating, uh, you know. Yeah. Half, you know, uh, uh, I don't believe in ghosts either or even the word ghost. So I see this as just machine. Yeah, see, that's what I'm worried about. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you're just here for the machines and not here for the cool ghost stuff. I, I continue to think this is great. It's a very interesting thing that they're doing with this where it's like we're getting more information about these characters after the arc. Like, after all the Geiger stuff, like these kind of two issues, we found out more about these characters in these last kind of two issues than we have the whole series, which is very interesting artistically to do uh after the fact kind of hit us with this stuff but uh i still i still love it i think it's a very weird kind of unique character gary frank's art is just uh super tight bananas so yeah i'm 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 in it to win it i love this issue uh any uh any geiger stuff they want to do especially when they have like a two-headed hound dog or a wolf dog i'm all hound about dog. it I agree the art's really nice, and this story I think is good. I just feel like it's literally the same story we've already read with a couple more details added, and it's just strange to me, What? and I understand there's a, a re market reason to do all of this. It feels like we've seen Geiger be like, I got to open this door for five issues mm -hmm. has been his whole thing. And I just, I find it strange. Why don't you, if we've already seen that, just do a different version of the story or come at it from a different way to get us to the point where you have the shared universe rather than be like, let's keep him doing the same thing. So I, it just felt repetitive. Even Doors if are hard, man. For I don't know why mm -hmm. you think they're easy. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's a pull and he doesn't know. That's in Jurassic Park. Park. They were like, wow, those raptors are opening doors. And that was clever Geiger. Clever yeah. Geiger. Oh. <laughs> Catwoman number 60 from DC Comics, written by T.D. Howard, art by Stefano Raphael. Catwoman now has literally nine lives and is taking oh, on the most dangerous mission she can because she can afford to lose the lives. Here she's going up against Flamingo, a criminal who likes to eat faces, but there's a bunch of twists as she is in Croatia, as we know from hostile movies is one of the most dangerous places you could possibly be um what you guys think about this one i like that she was at the theater of death which is a place i interned at when i was um uh, classically training as an actor 
Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of Commedia dell'arte, a lot of great mask work here. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, I can't clown. tell if this is a real place or not, if you're just fucking around. No, this is a real place where people eat your face. Oh, man. It's just a place where people eat your face. That's the opening number. Yeah. Uh, I like the, really like the art in this. I thought it was really nice. It felt very sort of site-specific. I like that Catwoman is getting out of Gotham because she's had a tough couple of years with the the Batman relationship and then this uh, gang war or whatever that she had <laughs> for some reason to deal with. So it's nice that she's on the road. I am a big fan of Teeny Howard's work, uh, but this is just so stressful. She's just burning through these lives, man. I'm really worried. It, you know, you got uh, nine. You can burn. Yeah, like that's seven, that's eight that. Of them. That's what that philosophy that I'm worried yeah. about. Like, I don't have to start paying attention still until I get to like seven, eight, or nine. It's like, no, stop wasting lives. I got that's, three wishes. It's fine. I'm going to do the first two. Who cares? <laughs> that's I 100% agree with you, Pete. That's what I said about the last issue as well is I feel like there needs to be a reckoning in terms of how reckless Catwoman is being. And I, I don't know two issues in if that is coming, but that to me is the most interesting thing. So we'll see where it goes. I think there is. I think it is that that feels to me what the point of this is. So, mm-hmm. you know. Superior Spider-Man, number two from Marvel, written by Dan Slott, art by Mark Bagley. The, uh, not Superior Spider-Man, but Doc Ock has remembered that he used to be Spider-Man yeah. and has figured out that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, so is gutting for him directly in this issue. However, by the end, spoilers here, they are teaming up to take down a common enemy. What would you guys think about this one? What a surprise to see Spider Boy popping up in here! Did you guys see? Yeah, Spider Boy! Oh man, people love Spider Boy, man. Yeah, I don't know if I mentioned this, but Spider Boy number one was one of the biggest selling titles of last month. No, you didn't. Nobody listens when you talk. All right, I think the uh, I love first off, love the word search in this comic. Really great to see that. Felt very old school. Um, yeah, I like where things got to in this. This is really fun having Doc Ock and Spider Man team up like this, especially for what, for the reason that it is. And I'm not. Tr- I'm trying not to spoil. But yeah, I think this is. They I was love th- each other. They love. They love. Each other. They're in love. Yeah, yeah. it's no. love. Well, sure, there is love involved, but yeah, I just think this is it's a, a great... tentacle face hug. <laughs> I think this is a, just a great use of the kind of BS that's happened. And so I'm happy with the forward movement that we're having in this. And so, yeah, this is just another example of Dan Slott having some fun. And it's nice to see people who we think are bad are making decisions for maybe good reasons. So it's it's nice, it's enjoyable. Tentacle face hug is Alex's uh, uh, search term on Pornhub also. <laughs> so just to be clear. Uh, this- I told you that in confidence. Yeah, it is. We were, yeah. there was a cone of trust around. Yeah, it sucks when you tell somebody hang. something off camera and then they blurt it out, huh? I know. Mm-hmm. It's, sorry, it's a slip. This is a real slip up. Yeah. The, anyway, uh, if anybody is curious, there's only two videos, but they're very good. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I swear you're in the background of one up. of them. Aren't you in the background of one I of have. them? I am. I am. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought I like this getting back into the superior Spider-Man world is fun. It is strange to me because Doc Ock is such a villain in the other part of the Spider-Man universe right now. So it's strange to have him be like, actually, we should work together. But hey, uh... hey that's continuity for you. Star Trek number 15, speaking of continuity from IDW, written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing, art by Marcus Till. The crew is doing some Star Trek stuff. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Well, first off, sick dragon cover. That's always fun. Uh, crazy cool fight-ish. I, I liked it. Uh, I feel like, uh, you know, they picked the wrong side, but uh, damn crazy ass last panel. Uh, yeah, I like the... Uh we get a lot of the different exposure to different crews. Um, I feel like the other, a lot of, a lot of the stories have been focused on the more next generation cast members. And this is really spreading it around, uh, which is uh, nice in a nice way. Um, and yeah, the last panel, I feel like that dude just keeps getting wrecked any which way he goes in the Star Trek universe. Yeah. yeah. Th- this is solid. I think this is good for Star Trek fans. This is definitely 
more of a big budget type thing that you could only do in comics in this issue, which is nice, given the dinosaur people, as Peach mentioned, and other things. Why don't we move on, though, to Green Lantern War Journal, number four, from DC Comics, written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos. John Stewart has been slowly taken over by an infection by the Radiant Dead, a Whoa. villain, evil, I guess you want to call it, from another mm-hmm. universe that has taken over his arm and is slowly taking over his body. He's fighting against that infection and ultimately, thanks to the help of a bunch of other folks, managed to push back on it by the end of the issue. This continues to be a really good Green Lantern title. What do you guys think? Really love the art here. Big scope, epic feel. Of course, it makes sense. It's Philip Kennedy Johnson. Uh, yeah. I'm enjoying this. Yeah, shit gets a little creepy, but uh, great ending. Excited for more really solid art. Uncanny Avengers, number five for Marvel, written by Jerry Dugan, art by Javier Duran. We have discovered that Captain Krakoa is none other than steve the nah. evil Steve Rogers from back in Secret evil. Empire. Evil. And over the course of the evil. issue, the Uncanny Avengers fight against him, leading to a new status quo for a bunch of folks. I had a lot of fun reading this issue. There's some ridiculous action sequences involving Deadpool yeah. in particular. I'm a little iffy about where steve ends up by the end of the issue, but curious to hear what you guys think. I thought this was a really fun issue. Deadpool was hilarious, wanted to be thrown like Captain Shield. Uh, loved him talking to Rogue about Gambit. That was really hilarious. Great art, funny comic, awesome action. I loved it. Yeah, really, the the Rogue Deadpool thing feels like there's actually a little bit of heart there. Uh, yeah. maybe. And that was, I really like that. I mean, the Dukes, uh, as Pete calls him, is great with Deadpool, obviously. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the Deadpool stuff, like you're saying, is fun. I uh, enjoy it's... the art here. Um, the the Stevel, I, I feel like that's a nice place. I won't spoil the name change, uh, but that's a sort of, that makes sense in a lot of ways and injects him back into the world in a way that can be uh, useful, I think. Agreed. Captera, Universal Truths, number five from Image Comics, written by Chip Sadarsky, art by Kagan McLeod. The He-Man riff continues as there is a big war on this world where Earth is invading. There's, as usual, a bunch of ridiculous humor going on here, some great action, and also some great heart at the same time. Yeah. I'm really enjoying the series. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, it continues to be over-the-top fun. Uh, you know, the same with the art. It's over-the-top and fun, and uh, it's kind of a crazy, tripped-out He-Man. Would I you say it's over-the-top and fun, Pete? Or? <laughs> I believe I said that enough times where oh, I don't okay. have to say it All again. Right. Just want to sum it up. I, I imagine Chip Zdarsky just banging his action figures together as a part of the writing process for this book, because that's that's what it feels like. Um, real quick on the count of three, let's say who, which side you're on, humans or Captera. One, two, three. Humans. humans. Oh, really? Wow. They're the, <laughs> definitely the bad guys. All oh, they are the bad guys here. The humans. Huh. Uh, but yeah, it is. Uh, everything is fun, wild, and creative, and I think the art has a really nice nostalgia feel to it. Jay Garrick, The Flash, number three from DC Comics, written by Jerry Adams, art by Diego Olo Tegu. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, this is teaming up Jay Garrick and his long lost daughter, the Boom, Judy Garrick. Judy! As they are unraveling a mystery that has laid dormant for multiple decades while she was gone. I. I was a little iffy about putting this in because I know you guys were okay with this title, but maybe didn't love it. But I I like it. Like, I think there's yeah. a good amount of emotion here. There's tension between Jay Garrick being way older than when he lost his daughter. And I, 
I think it's interesting. I'm enjoying the series. I mean, the art is unbelievable Good in art. this comic. I mean, you murder that poor artist's name, but I think the art does such a great job of pulling you into the story in such a cool way. I was just uh, super blown away by it. It was uh, really impressive. And I like the Stargirl cameo we got in here. This was fun. Uh, I enjoyed it. Yeah, Alex, just so you know, because of you murdered that name, the police who also were in the military are coming oh to your house God. right now to arrest Watch oh, out for guys, terrible bro. news. Watch yeah. out for the eyes. Uh, I also like this. I th I really like Judy Garrick, the boom, as uh, as a character. And I like that this, I feel like so many of the Flash family stories are just all over the place. And this one has just a nice focus to it. So I... Uh, Pardon the pun, but it feels like this story is slowing down and telling a story as opposed to all the other Flash stories, which are racing around, like doing too much, yeah, really which you may want to remember down. when we for a little bit later in this. Mm -hmm. Potentially. I last thing I'll say, Judy feels a little bit to be like vintage impulse if you're looking for that. Yes. And it also this feels like a classic jeff johns howard porter style story so Ooh, i think that's good. that's Refs. for me as well the incredible hulk number seven from marvel written by philip kennedy johnson art by nick klein the incredible hulk is teaming up with a old school ghost rider who rides around on a like world war ii era bike i guess is what it is um and fighting some ancient evils as he has wont to do throughout this line there's some great horror there's some great drawing of this literally hulking hulk in a way that we haven't seen him in a while what'd you guys think about this one yeah i mean again uh, don't be to me broken record but the art is phenomenal i mean this kind of creepy looking long-haired hulk is amazing uh, really, really blown away by it. It was just so fun to kind of just, after I've read it, to keep flipping through back and forth in this. The Ghost Rider is so old school and kind of fun. Uh, I'm also really happy with the place where they got, where they started off kind of fighting each other, classic comic story, and then they kind of teamed up, which was really cool. And then it seems like they're going to come back together, hopefully next issue to team up again. So... Very excited about that. But I got a question here, guys. Ooh. It seemed like there was this kind of extra panel that really freaked me out. He, uh, Hulk's talking to this uh, a very nice uh, uh, child um, after the kind of big fight. And then there's just one panel of the Hulk. And I don't know if it was just like an uh, image of the Hulk wishing he could smash this girl oh, into yeah. gooey bits uh, and doesn't. But, like, I was having a hard time coming back from that panel. I was like, what the fuck was that? Did he murder that girl or was he just daydreaming about murdering girls? Why is he doing that? Because Hulk smashed, you're saying. Yeah, I think that's a mystery to be unraveled going forward. Clearly, that was something he was fantasizing or daydreaming or something. Does the Hulk fantasize or daydream about murdering people now? Sure. I think there's okay. some entity who is investing him in making okay. him think that stuff. So. Uh, uh, very much so in this very issue. But yes, I agree with you that that page is a little bit like that panel. Hard I to tell like, if it what happened the... or not. Yeah. yeah. What? How are we supposed to move forward after you show me that? Uh, the well, we do uh, because it's horror, and a lot of times there's things that are scary that, that uh, catch us off guard. The this remind I love the contrast between Green Hulk the fire of the ghost rider and then uh the goo yeah. goo eye folks later on is really nice from an art artistic point of view and then this just reminds me of like just great horror and a little bit of philip kenny johnson's uh mm -hmm. Felspire chronicles was that mm -hmm. his that was his um sort of fantasy dark fantasy book that he first really jumped on the scene with uh back in the day and it has shades of that and i really like that Canary, number two from Dark Horse Comics, written by Scott Snyder, art by Dan Panosian. This is a Western supernatural story where a bunch of folks are trying to investigate weird goings on in a, I'd say a mine, but really it's just a, a hole in the ground. Sure. Mm. Uh, lots of stuff True. going on here. I will say I had 
I felt like a little bit of a hard time following on exactly what the action is, but at the mm. same time, there's some very creepy things that come out of Dan Podosian's pencils. I'm intrigued by the mystery regardless. How about you all? I really enjoyed this. Mm. Uh, maybe I grew up near a mine, but this really resonates with me. Um, I think it's good, good, slow, uh, slow pace horror in a nice way. And uh, like the art, I like that we got a lot of panels. Yeah, I like we got a lot of story here in this. Yeah. It has a, a nice shape to it. And one of my favorites of the week, actually. Yeah, this is a crazy ass issue here. Lots of twists and turns, amazing art, really cool, creative story. I'm very excited to see what happens next. Rare Flavors, number three for Boom Studios, written by Ram V, art by Felipe Andrade. This is following a demon who loves to eat people, and he has tried to make a documentary with the documentary filmmaker, but the filmmaker is not quite into it. Um, there's some big moves in this issue in terms of the plot that I can't believe came only three issues in. But as usual with this team, just really good stuff. There's a great mini story rappling throughout here about a man who left his home country, came to the United States, became super, I think it was the United States, became super successful, but ultimately craved the food of his homeland that I thought was really beautifully done. Yeah, I yeah. mean, th uh, this has to be, you know, weird for justin because you know he works in hollywood and mm. there are so many yeah. times where he's on a production and you think you have this amazing story about somebody and then they reveal that they just like eating people I eating mean, people happens yeah, all the eating time people it just Gabris? all all the Gabris, time Gabris eating people i was just out in la walked in and Gabris. yeah and how'd Pally that go eating people Both well, i guess we'll people. get into a week and geek more but i yeah i just think that like uh you know you've you heard the story a million times and it's heartbreaking because these people put all this time and energy into production and doing all this stuff. And then at the last minute, the reveal of like, Oh, I love people. And it was like, yeah, I heard you say that everybody loves people, but like, you, you no, I love people. people. Yeah. How, they say Hollywood will eat you alive. And this is what they mean. Straight yeah, exactly, cannibalism. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy this as well. Love a recipe. Just really <laughs> hitting you with a recipe. Oh here. yeah. And I agree with you. Like I, it is moving quickly, but I actually really like the bigger swings. It feels like it's helping to get the story moving faster. A story that I feel like in the first these first three issues has sort of been like a little bit uh, hard to put your fingers all the way around. But the art is just so beautiful and has this kind of like dream like uh, uh, flowiness to it, which is really very cool. Batman Santa Claus, Silent Night number three from DC Comics, written by Jeff Parker, art by Michelle Banditti and Trevor Harrison. We have now pretty much the full Justice League is teaming up with Santa Claus to try to take down Krampus, who is being controlled by some external entity. We don't know exactly who that is. Like Dark Side, probably. Yeah, Dark Side or whatever, or Christmas Dark Side, I guess, whatever that might be. I guess we'll see. Uh, what? I'm having a very fun time. What? I'm having a very fun time reading this book. What about you guys? What just happened to you? You just get stuck on repeat? No, I said what, and then I changed the uh, direction of the sentence, and I thought it was kind of funny, so I said what again. That oh, okay. I liked um, it. I like thanks. when we just say stuff randomly <laughs> i don't know man uh anyway back to this i thought this was uh so i thought the first issue i was like oh my god this is so much fun and then the second issue i was like well how long is this gonna go on i don't know like but now i'm back i think this is just so such a blast love the cover peppermint john from the workshop that's hilarious and then uh you know, uh, Superman, uh, you know, I mean, the, you know, we get, you know, Krampus takes Robin. I mean, that's, you know, that's scary. Krampus. You know, I mean, what's going to happen next? But uh, I'm having a blast with this. What? I agree. I have also, <laughs> I love a jacked Santa who's just like coming through. He's like axe body spray Santa. He's oh, here man. to wreck some Come shit. On. I like the Justice League characters we see featured here. 
I like how seriously they're taking every aspect of Santa Claus. Uh, it's it's fun. And last note I'll mention, I love S- Superman just being like, oh, Santa Claus. It's, yeah. Love it's, Santa. Uh, of course he does. He's a Santa freak. Cute. His weakness outside of kryptonite, Santa. Doctor Strange, number 10 for Marvel, written by Jed McKay, art by Pasquale Farah. This is finishing up the storyline where Doctor Strange has been fighting against General Strange, his future self, who has fought thousands of years of war. Um, He comes up with a solution that in classic Jed McKay fashion makes a lot of sense and works really nicely. Agree. Like I, I've loved this, uh, these, this series so far. Very excited to see what comes next. I thought this wrapped up really well. The Pasquale Fairy art is fantastic. Like I wish we had a chance to make some sort of list of like our favorite comics of like uh, a time frame to be to be decided because this would be on mine. You know what I mean? Oh, would it? What? Well, I think I think the real hero here is the art. I mean, this is just. And the writing. Ripped out, beautiful art. Yes, of course, the writing. This is a touch. I'd say it's worth it for the art alone. Oh, well, that's a great phrase. Um, Yeah, I I thought this was a touching ish. Uh, Doctor Strange is just a big softy, and I love it. Um, And fun seeing the dog as well. Doctor Strange, more like Mr. Softy. Hey! Ice cream head. He's got an ice cream head. Hey! Lotus Land, number two for Boob Studios, written by Darcy Van Pell, guest art by Chao Felipe. We have a detective who is Bye, investigating Felipe. a weird, weird. Wow. Uh, sci-fi. I, that's a, that's a, we do a lot of reaches on this show. That's a reach. That's a Jack Reacher right there. That's, yeah, that's a Jack Reacher. That's a Jack Reacher. <laughs> you know, when we call a Jack Reacher, that means please stop. The. Uh. Uh, we have a direct detective who is involved in uh, investigating a weird mystery involving memory, per the title, as you can figure out. Uh, this is really good and interesting, I, at least in my opinion. What do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, first off, you have an amazing, creepy cover and uh, an amazing last panel. Uh, love the tone of the art. So cool, so powerful, such an interesting world this comic has created, and it's worth checking out. I don't know what's happening in this comic book. <laughs> this comic book issue that we're talking about. Yeah, but do you but have to cool... always know? No, 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 not always. Yeah. Uh, but in the second issue, I'd like to know a little bit. Uh, but I understand some of the vague ideas and uh, some sad stuff happens. And bad bad, bad and then sad. And yeah. that's that's cool. Well, let's see if you understand Justice League versus Godzilla versus Kong number three. So many verses. Can three people <laughs> fight at yes. a time? Bless you. Can three different people can three different people fight at a time? Did you just mute because I sneezed? Yes. Uh, did that work? <laughs> <laughs> did it work to erase what? your sneeze? <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> From DC Comics, written by Brian Bucciolato, art by Christian Duce. The Justice League is fighting Godzilla and Kong. I don't know. What and is- and others and a bunch of other <laughs> at all as they say uh superman has been taken out by godzilla maybe he's dead i'm gonna venture a guess that he's probably he's not dead. but everybody's reeling from that yeah and meanwhile lex luther and the injustice league are making some moves in the background uh what'd you guys think about this one uh this is fun i mean you got giant monster battles it's a good time um but yeah, it was a, there was a weird, interesting moment where like they tried to tell Batman Superman's dead. He was like, "What? No, no, not my guy. I'm not. I'm not even. I'm not even. I'm just going to keep moving on here because that's a ridiculous thing to say to me." I I, I thought it was a weird reaction, but uh, I'm going to keep reading and uh, find out what's going on. I want less about relationships and people dying and more monsters fighting please thanks more relationships i've seen monsters fight in my life i don't need it everywhere um i actually i do like the monster stuff here i like the justice league working together to take them down yeah it's awesome uh very fun uh nice art gods number three for marvel written by jonathan hickman art by valerio shiti we are following a bunch of different threads here as the two different factions, the powers that be, and I'm forgetting the order of things, I believe, are mm-hmm. 
following different paths to try to figure out what's going on with this guy, Corbis Cube, who uh, attacked them in a previous issue. Meanwhile, Doctor Strange is also there. So again, a lot of stuff going on, but I don't know. There's a lot of creative stuff. I feel like the more that I read this, the more this is... Jonathan Hickman kind of throwing off a bunch of ideas in a funny way, which I was not expecting for this book, but I'm generally enjoying. Like funny haha? Yeah, funny haha. There's a uh, there's a frogman who welcomes the, welcomes them to a restaurant. Yeah, that was fun. I like that. I I've I am started to enjoy this. I like this issue a lot. I like the Cassandra stuff running through here. I like the sort of fantastical nature it feels like now we're into the story and we, we don't have to do as much like table setting it's just like let's just follow these fun weird ideas and in, in these weird places it's, it's funny to have dr strange there who is sort of like just meant to be like zounds over and over again he's like an alarm clock character for how dangerous things are uh but and the rest of the characters seem are completely original so uh it's he- Strange. Yeah, I agree with JT1 here. I think that this, um, you know, at first I was like, all right, what's going on? But let me unfold my arms here and start to enjoy what's really happening. This is a very cool Unfold issue. them. Yeah, a lot goes down in this uh, in this issue. The art is amazeballs. I, I, uh, I, I, I'm in now. I, I wasn't before. It took me three issues, but now I'm in. Uh, Pete, when you have your arms folded, who's turning the pages? Do you have a page boy? No, I don't. I don't. When your arms page. are folded because you're like, what's happening? And look how your pages just turn themselves. Well, you must I, have a page boy, a la page boy. I, I don't. I don't. Hmm. Uh, I unfold huh. them to turn my uh, pages. I turn kill, my own pages. Do you kill your darlings number four from Image Comics written by sure Ethan do, S. Buddy. Parker and Griffin Sheridan? <laughs> Art yeah. by Robert Quinn. This follows a girl who has traveled back to her imaginary playland of her youth, discovered it's been corrupted by an evil entity there. In this issue, she's fighting back against the evil entity or really on her back heels against it as it fights back against her. Um, This is dark and disturbing and good stuff. What a great, love the art in this. It's really like just, fighting above its weight class with the art here it's really great and the story you know there's not a ton it's not weighted with a bunch of like mythology building here it really is just like moving through and uh, emotion above mythology in this book yeah this is intense uh yeah i uh this is a lot of scary shit man great art intense ish though uh, this uh freaks me the fuck out in a lot of different ways Titans Beast World Tour, Central City number one from DC Comics, written by Cy Spurrier, Jarrett Williams, Alex Pactendahl, and A.L. Kaplan. Art by Scott Koblish, George Cambadius, Serge Serg Acuna, and A.L. Kaplan. We're focusing on the speedster characters who live in Central City as a beast plague takes over the entire world and turns people into beast things. Specifically here, we're getting Godspeed, a flash villain, is turned into a big wasp. You know, the way to fight him is a bunch of bees, I guess. Yeah, this is sort of chaos. This is the book I was talking about where it feels like just chaos is happening here. Right. And, right. you know, I like that we're into the beast world stuff. We're getting to see it play out, but... This one just feels like too much all at once. I would have j- rather have seen this with half of the characters doing doing half of the things. And it doesn't, the art is a little bit contributing to that because it's just a chaotic art style. I, I don't, in, in a lot of them, I don't dislike it, but it just makes for sort of a doubling effect on too much on too much. Well, I, you know, I agree with you what you're saying, but I really liked the art. Um... It kind of adds to the chaos and the kind of stress of what's going on in an interesting way, which I appreciated. But um, I also like the backups. I thought they were good as well. I like the idea of having a story as a framing device that runs throughout just structurally with this sort of thing. I thought that was smart to do and follow Barry Allen as he goes through an emotional journey over the course of the issue. But the place that they ended up 
was so weird. Uh, particularly How weird was it? Very weird. <laughs> <laughs> good Pete. stuff. Um, yeah, I still don't have a handle on the Beast World event. <coughs> We've gotten two issues of it, and that's pretty much it. So... I don't know. We've been reading a lot of these T Titans Beast World Tour issues, and it always feels like the story where somebody's like, oh, we're hanging out at a diner, a bunch of beasts out there. Do you want to go on with our regular business while the world is turning to beasts? Which is very weird. It is weird yeah. at this point that we have read multiple issues over multiple weeks where that is the same thing where the world is like, I don't know, beasts again, I guess. Well, everyone's very busy. You know, everyone's mm -hmm. like, you know, on social yeah. media, and so they're a little distracted. They're like, it's you want to check out Beast World? A lot to do. You want to absorb some spores and see what beasts we turn into? Spore fall. Yeah. I would love to see what teens are doing in Beast World. Are they like <coughs> mainlining spores? Could you? Into beasts? I want to see Mister. I want to see Mister Beast World. <coughs> Could you try to doing? die while we're doing this podcast? He no, swallowed a bunch it. of spores. He's going to turn into an animal. I did. We have five more titles, and we'll see if I make it. All right. <coughs> oh my god the amazing spider-man number 40 for marvel written by zeb wells art by john ramita jr versus the last thing we're talking about this is a hyper focused event about a gang war breaking out in new york here we're getting spider-man she hulk and tombstone are teaming up to take down a bunch of criminals who are fighting throughout new york I said this with the last issue and i'll reiterate it here this is the best Amazing Spider-Man has been in a very long time. And a lot of that is just down to focusing on Spider-Man stuff. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree with you. It, it's fun. I, I just, the She-Hulk Spidey team up is really, is really hitting. We get the tracksuit mafia of, of Hawkeye yeah. fame. Used Come much, on. used much more Stop seriously wrong. than in mm -hmm. that. Um, and I also think it's fun, like, we have, like, this is being treated very, like, you know, Batman, DMZ, like, high stakes. But then you occasionally see in the background of them being like, we have to go, we have to fight our territory, we're being invaded. And then Electro's in the background with his, like, dumb mask, just being like, hey, what's up, guys? It's me with the old yellow face, yellow mask face hanging out. Well, it's also, that's the, I will mention the Lady Electro. I do love the team of female variants of the villains who are led by beetle yeah. however beetle's new costume stupid no, i agree right, not right, good right. The, the the juxtaposition of the superhero the villain costumes and the actual high stakes gang war action i think is a little bit undercutting but i was excited to see in this on the map that we're now in brooklyn here we're spider now instead of being yeah bad guys. we were saved we were saved man all right. Uh, yeah, I have to agree with the Zelbatron here. This is really uh, a glorious issue. I mean, uh, I, I we're finally focusing on Spider-Man shit, not dumb shit. So I'm uh, really, and of course, you know, you got John Romina Jr. here. So super tight Nanners art, uh, fun banter, great ish. I cannot wait to see what's going to happen next. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed all the Tombstone stuff. This is just a fantastic issue. Only one other thing. Strange to see. This is a light spoiler for the end of the issue. Strange to see our guy, the Kingpin, here. Because mm -hmm. he's busy. What a great, yeah, that's a huge reveal at the end, man. You just spoiled it. And his his partner, Typhoid Mary, also here. She's uh, lost, presumed dead. Yeah. In current continuity. So a little bit of a... A little weird, but I love the Silence of the Lambs door moment that goes on here with the Fisks that I thought was yeah. very smart and very well done. So agree. I'm glad to enjoy Amazing Spider-Man again. New Bird, number 13 from Image Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky, art by Jacob Phillips. The noose is tightening around a new bird and his new partner as the various mob families of New York try to cut ties with him or basically get him in a corner. Nobody puts Newberry in a quarter, though. Wow, we all know that. that's right. Famously, what'd you think about this issue? Uh, this comic's great. It's just such a great pot boiler, ratcheting up the tension. You feel it in this issue, especially things are not going well. Uh, I'm excited to see how Newburn is going to wiggle his way out of this one. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know how many different ways we can talk about this comic. It continues to be uh, really impressive and artistically uh, amazing. So, yeah, it, it's still doing that. <laughs> No, you're you're honestly you're right, Pete. Reading this, I was like, this continues to be good. I have no further things. To say. <laughs> I, I continue to enjoy this. It's intriguing. Yeah. There's so Jacob much Phillips going art, on. very good. I Fucking like his unbelievable. art. Unbelievable. Yeah, the art style art. is glorious. You're burnt out on the episodic nature of enjoying something. Maybe. There you go. Well, but the, the, I will say in a very not to get too better about it, but I waffled about putting this in the stack because I was like, legitimately, what else can we say about this at this point other than this is good? But also, I want to read it because I like reading it. So, yeah, there you go. Let, let's put it on the um, the top thirty of uh, December twentieth, twenty twenty three. Yeah, oh, wow. that sounds good. Good rundown. Daredevil Black Armor number two from Marvel, written by DJ. DG Chichester, art by Netho Diaz. This is harkening back to a time when Daredevil had faked his own death, was pretending to be a guy named Jack Batlin, and was dressed up as Daredevil, but telling everybody that he was an entirely different Daredevil. Here he's teaming up with Spider Man, fighting Hobgoblin and Sabretooth. Same as the first issue, I was like, I don't want to like this. This is very stupid. What what a stupid error of Daredevil. And by the end, I was like, yeah, it's fun. I'm having a good time. I feel like this is a bunch of Marvel trading cards from the 90s thrown in a cardboard (laughs) box and shaken up and being like, hey, guess who's here? It's Sabretooth, Daredevil, Spider-Man, a couple other randos. Uh, But I agree with you. It does work, even though it feels absolutely random and out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, it kind of reminds me of like when they, you know, you release the He-Man action figures, then it was the battle armor He-Man action figures. Um, And yeah, Spider-Man's poking some fun at the armor in this issue. Uh, But yeah, this is, I still had a blast with this. Uh, We're making fun of it a little bit, but still, this is great art, really cool story. You get to see Mole Man and stuff. There's great cameos, cool villain stuff. I enjoyed it. Star Trek Defiant, number 10, from IDW, written by Christopher Cantwell, art by Mike Fien and Pau Rodericks. The crew from the Defiant has headed to Talos for, is that the name of the planet? From yes. back in the cage, the original episode of Star Trek, and there's some trippy mind stuff going on. I thought this issue was great. I love the throwbacks here. I thought there were some fun jokes throughout. There's some great continuity stuff for Star Trek. I thought this was a really good done in one. I mean, it's not done in one because it's over multiple issues, yeah. but like essentially done in two Star Trek adventure that feels like it could stand with a good episode of literally any Star Trek series. I agree. This was my um, my favorite of the two Star Trek books uh, for the reasons you're saying. Uh, like, Great stuff. They found a nice, uh, Christopher Cantwell found a nice like philosophical underpinning for the story that also was able to scoop up all of these references from the past, especially, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? The Thief from Who Travels Through Time from Next Generation, who, one of my favorite episodes of, of TNG. Uh, great to see him here. Yeah, this is a uh, good trek in time here. Uh, Spock sees through his lies and gets to the bottom of it. Uh, you know, great, uh, solid art. Enjoyed this comic. Yeah, great Spock, great Wharf stuff, fun stuff with Hugh the Borg as well. I just yeah. had a really good time reading this. They what cracked we- it. Let me just say real quick, they really have cracked these Star Trek comics by mm-hmm. bringing in favorite characters across all of the different series. Like, that's so smart, and it's really working. It's it almost uh, you know makes you think that the Star Trek comics have been so good if it's something we should bring up uh, as maybe the best of the year. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think I don't think so, but oh. let's talk about a title that's definitely making best of the year: Wolverine number forty from Marvel, written by Benjamin Come Percy, on! art by Ibrahim Mustafa. Mustafa. Wolverine is making a world tour, teaming up with various people throughout his history, something that he realizes in a very metatextual way throughout this issue as he teams up with Spider-Man to try to take down Orcus. It's kind of unsuccessful in a surprising way. But 
yeah, I really liked how this issue spooled out plot wise, and I'm intrigued to see where it goes next. This issue is insane. The idea that they're like, I got a plan. We're going to fly this ship up there. And it just goes, falls apart instantly. They're both Spider-Man and Wolverine are both stuck in space without any protection on for like too long. It, it, this is just a wild issue. But like, I feel like that's what we've come to expect from Benjamin Percy's Wolverine. It's just like wild swings that just keep landing, I feel like. Yeah, it's it's crazy intense. The whole time I'm like, man, how is Wolverine out in space right now? He doesn't have a mask or any he's like kind a, of some sort of space Wolverine. It's oh, crazy. <laughs> I walked right into that one. God, yeah, damn you it. did. You ah, said it. You yeah, said the yeah, words. Yeah. But it was great uh, teaming up with Spidey. Uh, although it was really messed up that Wolverine ate his hot dog. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That was no, I do up. that. I do that to strangers all the time, and everyone thinks it's so fun. It's like a Mentos commercial. Ha <laughs> ha! He ate my food. <laughs> and if you want to eat our food, you can support us at Patreon.com/slash Comic Book Club. Also, no, we do a live show every Tuesday night at food. seven PM to Facebook and YouTube. You can't eat it. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about comic books. Apple, Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter slash Facebook. Nope. Twitter slash X. Uh, at <laughs> Comic Book Live on Instagram. Someday, and Alex. TikTok. I don't know. Oh, I, I hope we can get on Facebook. That would be really cool. ComicBookClubLive.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, we'll see you at the Comic Book Club. I just okay, want to... I- I just want, real quick, I just want to make one thing clear. A lot of times Alex speaks for both of us, but when it comes to our food, he does not speak for us, and you can't have any of mine. Wow, that's really good. Uh, just on the count of three, choose between food or humans. Ready? One, two, three, food. Human food. Oh. Well, you PD humans. He's eating humans. <laughs> PD humans.